Hello everyone, this is Richard from Modern Healthy Hong Kong and welcome to the third in our series of interviews with Dr. Michael Snyder from Stanford University. In this video, Dr. Snyder will talk about how we can use wearables to track our health and be alerted when we are ill even before we notice it ourselves. Yeah, and so I, I do want to talk a little bit about the wearables. So we did a lot with these big data measurements initially. And then I'd say about seven years ago, we got very involved in the wearables. Right. And um, we got involved at a time when uh, Fitbit was out there, but they're mostly being used as fitness trackers. People would wear these, you know, follow their steps, uh, that kind of thing. And then they throw their watch in the drawer because they kind of figured out their patterns and what's the point. Uh, mm -hmm. I get it. So we realize that these are actually more than, uh, uh, you know, just fitness uh, <laughs> trackers that you could actually use these to be measuring health. And to us, they were very attractive because they didn't just follow your health. They follow your health all the time. Mm -hmm. They're constantly measuring your physiology, your heart rate, your, your skin temperature. The devices these days follow quite a bit, something called heart rate variability, which is an important health measure. There's other things. Some of the watches will even do blood pressure, which is pretty incredible. So they measure a lot of different things, and they're measuring them 24-7. They'll take 250,000 or more measurements a day on your physiology. So they're very, very powerful devices. And so, as I say, we got involved in this pretty early on because we realized what they were good for. The Apple Watch wasn't out yet. Uh, we did find that the hard part was getting access to the data. And so we did find one company um, that, did give us that access and we, we worked with them. We got, got the watches and we just started putting them on people to follow their physiology. And, and you know, one thing, so of course, I was always tested first as a, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm the guinea pig for all these things. As I say, we follow this 109 group of people, but uh, I'm always the guinea pig to see what's gonna go happen in case there are any boo-boos or anything. And, uh, you know, we learned quite a bit. For me, one of the most obvious things was, um, that your blood oxygen drops on airline flights. That, that actually mm -hmm. is known, but it's not well known. Pi uh, most pilots know, but most flight attendants don't, we've discovered. And most lay people don't know. So when you get on an airplane you and the plane takes off the ground, they don't pressurize the cabin, so your blood oxygen drops. Well, they don't pressurize it to normal atmospheric pressure. So, so the it'll drop, uh, typically it's about 8,000 feet. It varies with the aircraft. We now know all this and uh, your blood oxygen drops. And it turns out that that correlates with fatigue we've discovered. Mm -hmm. So we, and we can see how far people go. So the reason you get tired on airplanes is because you're, they drop the air pressure isn't, you know, the same as what you're doing now on the ground. And so therefore your blood oxygen drops and you get tired. And that's why you're tired on airplanes. No matter how juiced up you are, the odds are you're gonna get sleepy on an airplane. So anyway, um, that's one of the things we discovered. So that was kind of amusing, but that may or may not be so impactful for your health. So like the, the, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was, so I was going to ask, um, so th there are lots of, variable, um, lots of wearables that are available right now and uh, commercially. So if somebody wanted to start tracking themselves, I mean, which, what, what, what type would you recommend? I, mean, what is the, I guess what is the most important thing to track? And what, yeah. type of, what type of device would be best for that? Yeah, can I come back to that in one minute? Yeah. Sure, yes. Okay. I'll just tell you one more story personal mm -hmm. on this, yes. so, and then you can figure out how to, if you want to splice all this together, yeah. how to handle that. So the other thing, so after the airline one, uh, you know, I was measuring it kind of cool. It turns out I actually figured out my, when I first got Lyme disease mm -hmm. from my smartwatch and from a, what's called a pulse ox, one of these things that measure your blood oxygen. And so the backstory there was I was helping my brother put up fences in rural Massachusetts where 55% of ticks are Lyme infested. Mm -hmm. And then I was flying to Norway through Frankfurt. So from the US, from San Francisco, I was flying first to Frankfurt and then to Norway. And on that last flight from Frankfurt to Oslo, Norway, uh, I, me I measure myself all the time. I noticed that my blood oxygen was abnormally low and my heart rate uh, actually went fairly high. Uh, I was not yet symptomatic. Um, and when we landed on the ground, they neither came back to normal. So they were both off. Heart rate was still running high, blood oxygen low. 
And then uh, I later got a fever, so I did get symptomatic the next day. Uh, and it kind of went off and on. And I knew something wasn't right when it first went off, because again, I measured me all the time. And so I went to a physician in Norway. I warned him it might be lying because it was two weeks after I'd been helping with these fences. And so when I was there in Norway, uh, I warned him it might be lying. He drew blood and saw my immune system was off. Said, yeah, you got a bacterial infection. Uh, you know, I recommend penicillin. I said, no, I think I need doxycycline, which is what you take for Lyme. And as you might imagine, a little bit of a standoff there because most physicians don't like to be told from the patients what to take. But he did give in and I took it and cleared it up right away. You take it for two weeks. So when I got back, I got tested and sure enough, I was Lyme positive. So in fact, I had antibodies of Lyme. I even had some antigen left. And then, uh, and as well controlled because before I'd left for Norway, three days before I'd given blood and we checked that and I was negative. So I see what's called sear converted during that time, meaning that I built a, a reaction to the line, obviously not mm -hmm. enough to clear it, you need the antibodies. So the point out of all this that I could tell when I first got Lyme disease from a smartwatch. So, and, and this pulse hog. So then what we did was we looked at all the data I had for me and this group of people we've been studying very, very carefully, those 109 people. And what we discovered was that um, for me, I had been ill four times. I had two years of data and I looked at that. It was gonna be a big deal. Uh, I, we looked at data, I'd been ill four times. Once was Lyme, twice were viral infections. And the fourth time, I didn't report any symptoms. I was asymptomatic, but I had high markers, just as high as I'd been infected, called CRP. It's a marker for being ill. And it turns out that once you know it, I was ill each of these times, and I looked at my data, and sure enough, my heart rate, and it also turns out my skin temperature, I, I learned this later for Lyme too, my skin temperature was elevated every single one of those times, okay? So we wrote an algorithm to be able to tell when you're getting ill, even before you realize it, because your heart rate goes up before you realize you're sick. And it turns out for some people, the skin temperature goes up, but not necessarily for everyone, at least as you can detect it for a smartwatch. So we wrote this algorithm and it also worked on the time I was asymptomatic, didn't have symptoms, okay? I did still pick that up. So we also then tested on three other people, one of whom was ill twice every single time we could pick up an elevated heart rate before they were symptomatic. So why is this a big deal? Well, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. So as you might imagine, we've been developing this program further. We're really pushing it along. Uh, and then the pandemic hits. And so we really just totally scaled this thing. So we're trying to tell when people are getting sick before, they're, before they realize it, from just a smartwatch. And just their resting heart rate will tell you whether you're getting ill. So we think heart rate is one of the most important things to measure for detecting illness. It's better than skin temperature or oral temperature even. And in fact, in the case of COVID-19, many people don't get a fever. In fact, many people don't get symptoms at all. But we can pick up when people are getting ill. We can see this heart rate. So we've taken, uh, 32 people have had COVID infections, and 80% of the time we can, set, we can see their increased arresting heart rate. And in some cases, it's 10 days before they got symptomatic, okay? So they've been running around for 10 days ill, spreading this and not even knowing it. And so that's the power of this. This thing, it tells you when, it tells you when you're getting ill, these smartwatches can, because your resting heart rate goes up. Very, very sensitive measure because they're measuring so constantly, right? They're measuring you 24 seven. So we've now written an alarming system. Uh, it's very, uh, I think, sophisticated computationally. It's an algorithm that can tell you when you're getting ill. It's measuring you all the time. What it does is it figures out your normal pattern. And then as soon as you have a shift from that normal pattern, it sends off a yellow alert. And if that, mm -hmm stays high for a while to send off a red alert, which will mean, you know, don't go to a bar, stay home, you know, don't go spread the virus. And if it shifts back to green, everything's fine, you're, you're cool. So we've written this alarming system. So we hope to roll this out. We're testing it now on a very, very small scale. We hope to roll it out within a month to get out to the world, to be honest. So we'll scale it. It's computationally very tricky because we're measuring millions of people all at once, pulling in their data, 
following them for heart rate. And when they see these abnormal things or when we detect these, that we've got to alert them. Then we think we've got it all figured out. So it's pretty cool actually to be able. And what's also pretty cool is that you may or may not realize 60% of the world, the whole world, has a smartphone. So 60% of the world has a smartphone. And so if you compare that with a smart watch, even something measuring as simple as a heartbeat, you can follow people's heart, yeah, their heart rate. You can follow people's illness for 60% of the world, including very remote places in the world. So we think these devices are gonna be super powerful. So, um, so yeah, so we're very, very keen. We think they can reach, they're not very expensive right now. They probably cost, you know, 200 bucks. You can get a cheaper one. They're fine too. They are, they're all very accurate for heart rate. Um, in the future, they're going to be $20. They'll be very, very inexpensive. So, so I think we can reach the entire world very inexpensively. So um, to your question about what's the best device to use, well, uh, we're always testing them. In fact, I'm wearing four smartwatches right now. This ring is, in fact, a sensor, too. It's an aura ring. So I use eight of these devices every day. Uh, these are the ones that are measuring heart rate. They measure skin temperature. They measure all kinds of different things. Uh, we're always evaluating. They're all pretty accurate for heart rate, resting heart rate. I think heart rate variability as well. Well, getting access to the data is, always not, is not always so easy. Uh, some of them have skin temperature. Some have what's called galvanic stress response. But some can even detect your change in blood oxygen, which we think is going to be very powerful. And they measure your respiration rate, by the way, too. And that's a big deal for viral infections, COVID-19 in particular. So the point is they're actually measuring quite a few different things. And because of that, and they're measuring you again, very high resolution, 24-7, so that you'll be able to tell when people are, something's going on that's not right. You're deviating from your normal physiology. And we're pretty confident if you have an infection of any sort, we should be able to pick that up. We do miss some cases, and we, we think we miss them because there are people who are on medications or have complications like severe asthma, where things, it's just, it's hard to get a normal, stable pattern from the measurements. So it's hard to, to tell when you have an outline measurement, an, an anomaly, so to speak. So, but anyway, we're working very, very hard on, on this to detect this. And I think these are going to be continuous health markers. So asking me which one's the best, well, once again, I'm conflicted. I have a company called Sensomics. <laughs> we like theirs the best. It's built okay. to make you your health. <laughs> right. So I, but yeah, so I was really thinking um, of style, type, rather than a specific. I mean, it's- Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So like a smartwatch that measures heart rate is kind of- They all measure heart rate. And they all measure pretty accurately, to right. be honest. And, and that so would I be- think that would be number one. That would be number heart one. Rate, heart, rate, heart rate and heart rate variability. If I could only have one measurement, that would be my top measurement. Those two. Is there, so, so one thing I saw in one of your papers that uh, it's great you get all this data, but then you need like an expert to, uh, to review it. Now, admittedly, like the heart rate is, is only one data point or one data stream, but uh, would there be any, any way that people, would be able to look at that. Is there any resource that they could use to uh, kind of look at that and come up with a? Yeah, great question. So uh, some of the companies are now building these dashboards on their phone. We built one that's meant to pull in all kinds of data. So it'll pull in your wearable data. Mm -hmm. And we've talked a lot about smartwatch data, but continuous glucose monitoring, we think it's very, very powerful for following people who are at risk for diabetes or have diabetes. Uh, the thing we've written can bring all that in your clinical data, even your, like your microbiome, all kinds of data can pull it all in and display it in a way that we think is going to be very, very powerful. So you're raising a really good point as we move in to the big data era. How do we manage all this data? How do we get it in a fashion that's usable for you and ideally for your physician? Mm -hmm. And so um, here, Again, this is why we're spending a huge amount of time trying to build this dashboard. And ultimately, what we want is something like your car. You may or may not know your car has tons of sensors, and race cars have 400 sensors or so. But at the end of the day, they display it all back on your dashboard in a very, very simple fashion. And that's how I think this is all going to work. Like, 
when you're getting ill, a signal will go off that's integrating your signals from your heart rate, heart rate variability, respiration. You know, all those things will give a signal that says something's not right. You have some sort of illness. And it may or may not be able to tell you whether it's COVID-19 versus influenza versus a rhinovirus. Uh, but maybe it can. We don't know yet. That's we're trying to push things. But minimally, it might tell you you're getting sick. And don't go out and, first of all, <laughs> spread you know this to the world. And second, maybe go see a doctor if it's starting to look severe. Or maybe if we can tease out signatures and say, well, gosh, this is accelerating quickly. This looks like a sign of a very serious illness. You should see, an Ill you should see a doctor now <laughs> before you are seriously ill. That's the kind of information we hope to get as we gather more and more information to learn how to work with it. So I had a question on that. So directionally, uh, are you trying to narrow down the markers so you can identify the clinically important ones? Or is the idea that, well, you just collect everything and then build a, an AI system with big data that uses all of it because you need that, that higher resolution? Yeah, the, the answer is definitely the latter. We're right. trying to build these, collect as much information as possible that the data tell us what's most useful, so do machine learning AI, to be able to pick out that information that'll be best correlated with certain kinds of illnesses. And, and uh, but having said that, at the end of the day, we have to take, distill that then into something usable mm. that clinicians can understand. I still think it's amazing people, and, and even now in the COVID pandemic, people, you walk up and they'll measure your temperature, right? I don't mm. know if you've gone through this yet, right? Oh, so yeah. they're measuring <laughs> temperature. And my reaction is, well, I don't really want your temperature. I want your heart rate. <laughs> I'll right. take both, by the way, your heart. But I think the heart rate, if I knew your normal heart rate and then measured you now, I'd have a much better indicator whether you're ill or not than measuring your temperature, uh, to be perfectly honest. So I actually think we want to change the medical system to be able to use the most data. A lot of these things we use are just historical artifacts, like people's oral temperature. I still think it has value, don't get me wrong. But, you know, it's the same measurement they've been using for decades. And the reality is there's probably much, much better measurements out there. We just don't know about them yet. Right. Yes. Thank you all for watching. I do hope that you found the video informative. With the proliferation of cheaper and more accurate wearables, we will be able to track our health ever more effectively. Please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button for video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and will speak to you again soon.